John Marshall was somebody who really believed that the Constitution was the thing that united us together as Americans. It reflected our deepest ideals. It reflected our grandest ambitions. Uh, and it needed to be supreme over federal law and over state law. And you see that reflected again and again and again. I think that's partly because Marshall was a nationalist. I mean, he really believed in the American nation. When a lot of other people had trouble conceptualizing America as a nation, not just a collection of individual states, but a nation, Marshall could see it. And he understood that the Constitution was a huge part of it. It's the thing that really united us and would set a frame of government that united us. And you see that in case after case. One of the lessons of, of John Marshall's jurisprudence and that his Supreme Court makes very clear is that the Constitution is the, the preeminent law in our country. So it, it does uh, take precedence over state law and over federal law. And of course, Marbury versus Madison, uh, his most famous case probably, uh, makes clear the Constitution trumps even congressional enacted law, even federal law. And I think that's as it should be. And it goes back again to, I think, the, the touchstone of Marshall's career as a justice, which is the centrality of the Constitution, the fact that it reflects the enduring will of we the people. And it's what really holds us together institutionally and even in terms of our ideals as a nation. I think that's really the touch point of his jurisprudence. Marbury is his, is his most famous, and I think that Marbury, again, stands for this proposition that the United States Constitution isn't an advisory document. It's not just a collection of aphorisms. It's not a series of suggestions. It is law. It has the force of law. And when you have two competing laws, whether that's a congressionally enacted law or a state enacted law, and where that competes with the Constitution, the Constitution has to take precedence. I think that's really what the holding of, of Marbury versus Madison is about. And that, that's the right outcome. And he was also, Marshall was, very keen, I think, to say that the courts have a role, have an important role in our democracy, and that is to protect the Constitution, is to protect the enduring will of the people with all of the limits on government power that, that implies, whether that's the state governments or the federal government. Now remember that in Marshall's day, the state governments were significantly more powerful than the federal government. So on those handful of occasions when Marshall's court uh, preempted, struck down state laws, it, it was acting against uh, what were the most powerful governments of his day. But above all, it was acting to protect the court was acting to protect the Constitution. So that's, that's how I understand Marbury, which is really how I understand all of Marshall's career. I, I think it was around the central principle. And again, his, his belief in the American nation. He was a nationalist. And I think that there's a lot to be learned from that. Webster was a great order, considered by many the greatest order of his day. But uh, listen, as, as somebody who has I worked at the U.S. Supreme Court, litigated at the United States Supreme Court, uh, and have also myself uh, delivered speeches on the floor of the United States Senate, as Daniel Webster did. Uh, you've got to have both logic and passion, I think. Every good advocate knows that. And there are some fantastic advocates in the history of our country, and they were able to do both. Now, I will say as a lawyer, you always want the text of the law, whether that's the text of the United States Constitution or the text of a statute, that has to control, obviously. So passion can't be a substitute for the law itself or else we wouldn't be governed any longer by laws, we'd be governed by men, as the old saying goes. But using the arts of rhetoric and using the appeal to emotion in order to illuminate or to elucidate that law, I think is part of what every skilled advocate does. Chief Justice, justices, judges on federal courts, whatever position they hold, uh, their job is to stick to the law and to the, uh, the decision of the law, to the elucidation of the law. I mean, it's the court's job to say what the law is, right, as Marshall himself said. So I think they shouldn't worry too much about what the political branches are saying. The courts are naturally going to be a subject of political discussion. That's healthy. After all, the courts are part of democracy. They're not apart from it, separate from it. They are enmeshed in democracy. So they will naturally be a subject of some controversy. One of the things we've seen in our own day is that our federal courts in the last half century, three quarters of a century, have become so prominent and so powerful in a way that Marshall didn't imagine uh, that they've become to act in many ways as uh, super legislators and uh, super legislatures as, as bodies. That has made them even more controversial, which I think is something to be lamented. But uh, I think we would all be better off if justices and judges stuck to their job as judges, as lawyers, and uh, left the political commentary to elected officials.
My view is, is that you don't cease to have friends uh, when you become uh, a member of the court. I mean, so Marshall has pre-existing relationships or foreign personal relationships, and Marshall and any other justice is entitled to his or her views on uh, particular pieces of legislation, policy, and I think they're entitled to express those. Better if it's probably done privately. Uh, than publicly. And of course, members of the court are not supposed to comment on issues that may come before them. And that is the ultimate, I think, backstop, is that uh, even if a justice does express himself or herself publicly on an issue, uh, if it is an issue that touches the court's own jurisdiction, then uh, they, re they should recuse themselves. Well, I would have wanted to know about his commitment to the Constitution. You know, I often say that I think it's the role of the United States Senate to put in, uh, to confirm into federal judgeships, judges who are pro-Constitution judges. Sometimes people say, well, that's just, that's too simple. I, I don't think so. At the end of the day, it's a pretty simple proposition. Either you think that the Constitution that the people wrote should control, or you think that something else should control. And a lot of times, in our own day, as in Marshall's, that something else comes down to the will of the judge. You know, the judge decides that he will make up his own uh, law, that she will substitute her views or preferences or desires for those of the law. So I would want to ask Marshall what I ask every judge who comes before me now on the Judiciary Committee. Are you committed to the Constitution that the people wrote? Are you committed to its primacy? over other laws, yes, but also over your own value judgments. Because every judge has to grapple with the fact that the Constitution is going to make value judgments that maybe he or she doesn't agree with. Just as laws that are written by the people's representatives will sometimes make judgments that they don't, they the judge, don't agree with. And so as a judge, part of what you have to do is, you have to be willing to say, the Constitution is supreme, the laws beneath the Constitution are supreme over my own preferences, whatever those may be. And I'd want to be sure that uh, Justice Marshall agreed with that. As it turns out, we know he did, because that's the, the theme of so much of his jurisprudence. It was not a warm relationship. I think Jefferson has this great line, I think, where he says that after having a lunch with John Marshall, this is when Jefferson is president, he says, whenever I sit down with Mr. Marshall, I hesitate to answer any question, because if I fear, I fear that if I answer something as simple as, is it the sun shining outside, Mr. Jefferson, that soon Marshall will have me agreeing with his notes and jurisprudence. So I think you get a sense that Jefferson, a deep antipathy, obviously, for Marshall, but also an appreciation of his very keen intellect and Marshall's ability to persuade. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention something else Marshall did just institutionally. Marshall got our court, the Supreme Court, to adopt the practice of issuing opinions, joint opinions. There's one majority opinion for the court. Uh, there may be di multiple dissenting opinions, but uh, there's one controlling majority opinion. And that's really his achievement. Uh, comparable courts in England, uh, even today, don't issue joint opinions in this manner. Marshall understood that for there to be uniformity in the law, it's important that the courts speak with one voice, and he was a strong advocate of that and, and set that uh, practice into place. Justices and judges don't cease to be citizens when they go on the bench, and so they're certainly entitled to their views and, and certainly entitled to express themselves. I would say they always need to be mindful of wading into policy decisions and policy controversies in a way that undermines the elected branches or the will of the voters ultimately, as in the constitutional amendment process, or certainly that prejudges cases or controversies that the court might hear. And you know, every judge has to bear that in mind. When it comes to Supreme Court justices, they're ultimately the judges of their own recusal. So they decide when they should recuse and when not. They can get advice on that, but they are ultimately the decision makers. So I think caution is always best there. Uh, but uh, our judges and justices are citizens, and uh, we want them to be active citizens in the Republic. Uh, but of course, they have a special role that they have to observe as well. Persuasion. I mean, really, it's the only tool that a Chief Justice has. You know, the title is a very grand title, but in terms of actual authority, over associate justices, but chief justices don't have any. I mean, you may think of the, if you think of the court as an organization chart, if you were to put the chief at the top and then the associate justices beneath him, one day I'm sure her, uh, you would find that there are actually no lines that connect the associate justice to the chief justice. In other words, there's no ability for the chief to compel anybody to do anything. He can't compel how they vote. He can't compel how they write their decisions. He certainly can't compel their views. So it's all a matter of persuasion, which goes back to Marshall's incredible strength. He was extremely persuasive. 
both in person and as an advocate. And you can see this in his opinions. I mean, his opinions are really, in, in many cases, rhetorical masterpieces. I mean, they sweep you along so that you barely notice potential counter arguments. You know, and his detractors, Jefferson chief among them, pointed this out often. They say, you know, you, you'd never get the idea there's a whole point of, other point of view if you listen to Marshall. And that really, I think, goes to his, his great strength uh, as an advocate. Uh, as a persuader, and he used it to tremendous effect on the court. I think the personal quality of collegiality, uh, being able to know your colleagues, to understand what their ideas are, to be able to, to speak to those. We don't know a lot about that internally in Marshall's court. Uh, we have a better sense of that uh, now from more recent chief justices. But I think that that is, that is, I can tell you from having observed the job up close, the ability to uh, understand where associate justices are coming from, what their concerns are, to address them in a way that will alleviate those concerns, and then also to pick who writes the opinion. Since the court does issue joint majority opinions, the one power that a chief justice does have that is fairly significant is if he is in the majority, he gets to assign the opinion, that is, assign who will write the opinion. Now, that's significant because you can choose individuals who you think will be able to hold together that majority coalition. So that is something that more recent chief justices who have been successful have done with some skill, uh, and that goes to managing uh, these personalities as well as the different viewpoints. So it's, it's a tough job, again, because the ability to compel just isn't there. You've got to persuade. I think that the concept of judicial supremacy was something that was unknown to him and I think frankly would horrify him, this idea that among the three co-equal branches of government at the federal level that the judiciary should have the final word on what the Constitution means, should have the only word on what the Constitution means, that Congress and the President have, have no role in constitutional interpretation, which is really the view adopted by the modern court just in the last 25 years. That was not the position advanced by uh, Marshall in Marbury versus Madison or McCullough or any of the other uh, key cases from his tenure. He was speaking to the primacy of the Constitution over federal and state law. He, he never suggested that the judiciary must be the sole and final word, and he also never foresaw the judiciary as a policy-making branch. And that's something I'm afraid that, that we have seen in this last century, particularly the last 50 years or so. The judiciary has really come to uh, occupy a policy-making role. That's exposed to the judiciary, I'm afraid, to, to all sorts of, of attacks, to all sorts of pressures and counter-pressures that would have been unknown to Marshall because it just didn't occupy that role in his day. So these are things I think he would have been concerned about that cut against his legacy because ultimately, the judiciary as a policy-making branch is contrary to the Constitution. And Marshall's whole point, his whole, the whole thrust of his career, was to elevate that Constitution as the nation's preeminent law. So we're, the, our challenge in our day is to make sure that that still remains true and that the legislature, Congress, still legislates, not the Supreme Court, that the president still enforces the law and that the court sticks to its role and doesn't try to usurp the roles of the others. Confirmation hearings have changed significantly, partly because the role of a justice has changed significantly since Marshall's time in ways he couldn't anticipate. When you have justices who are making our law and controlling policy on large swaths of domestic policy issues, whether that are economic issues having to relate to commerce, whether that's tech issues having to relate to antitrust law, whether that's social issues related to abortion or marriage or fill in the blank, uh, this is a circumstance just unknown in Marshall's day, where you have the Supreme Court now essentially locking down whole areas of law where the, the legislatures, the elected branches, aren't allowed to tread. And because of that, confirmation hearings have come to look like many elections. And you can see why. It's because if this person is going to go on the bench for a lifetime and is going to decide important areas of policy, that people want to know what his or her views are on policy. And I think because of that, these confirmation hearings have become longer, they've become much more intensive, they've become very intrusive, and they've become very policy-oriented. And I, I think that's probably not good for anybody. The way to fix it is to get the court back to adhering to the bounds of the Constitution and allow the, the elected branches, the political branches, to do their jobs. There's a lot of controversy about the facts of Marbury versus Madison. Uh, because of Marshall's uh, own involvement in the case. And there's also a lot of controversy about his reading of the underlying 
statute of the federal law that was at issue because there's a strong case to be made that Marshall actually overread it. That is, that he read that law to do something it, it, Congress didn't mean for it to do, and by overreading it, he gave the court the opportunity to say, ah, that's not consistent with the Constitution. So Marshall was, uh, he was certainly aggressive in that case on multiple fronts. And you know, Jefferson accused him of being aggressive as a jurist uh, all of his lifetime on the bench. I, I would just say that aggressiveness in defending the Constitution is not necessarily a vice. And I think here that Marshall's constant aim to elevate the Constitution of the United States, to build institutions like the Supreme Court, uh, his concern for the institution of, of Congress uh, in McCullough, to, to build institutions that, that the Constitution puts in place, that support the Constitution, that, that these are, particularly early in the life of our nation, admirable things, and, and we wouldn't be here today. The country as we know it wouldn't exist without John Marshall. When you don't have settled precedent that constrains you, there certainly is more running room available. But Mar part of Marshall's project was, he, he was looking at this Constitution and the government that the Constitution created, the government is brand new and many of the institutions, whether it's the Supreme Court, whether it's Congress, that the Constitution contemplates, are very young and their powers are not defined. He thought it was so important to define the powers of the respective branches and to make them as strong as the Constitution permitted, not stronger, but as strong as the Constitution permitted in order to hold together this young nation. And I go back to Marshall as a, as a nationalist. He believed in the American nation. He believed it would be a great nation. He could foresee a day when the United States would be the nation that we are now in terms of our standing in the world. And I think he looked forward to that day. He thought the Constitution would be the touchstone of that great American nation, and it was the great concern of his life to make it so, and I think he succeeded.